Yesterday, I uh, spoke about how essential it is to address the cause of uh, global desertification and climate change to offer any hope for future generations. And in that, I mentioned how the cause is the way we are all making decisions today in our agriculture and businesses, mainly uh, agriculture, and how it does not pay us to keep arguing different practices while under the same management, bearing in mind that everything we're calling regenerative today was practiced by uh, civilizations centuries ago, and they failed over uh, all regions of the world. So that's not what we want. Right, so I did mention that we would have no option but to include livestock as a tool. Not livestock run to produce milk or hide or meat or whatever as we've done for thousands of years, but primarily as a tool to address climate change which will also produce meat, milk, hide, etc. And I said that today I would cover why that is so essential that we do use livestock and run them properly, whatever properly means. So when we look at the global situation, um, can you all see that well? When we look at the global situation, we can see how um, vast the problem is in the brown areas, which are the areas of the world that do turn to desert. Now, where you are right now in the UK, is of course out of that brown area, you're in what we call a non-brittle environment. The rainfall of London and the rainfall of Johannesburg are about the same, but they're totally different climates. And today at breakfast talking to John, I see your rainfall here is about the same as we have in Zimbabwe, but ours comes in four months and then we have eight months of dry. So you're in one of these humid environments and no matter how badly you manage, it does not turn to desert because you cannot create bare ground and maintain it. With chemicals, fire, bad grazing, anything you do, nature keeps covering it. That's not like that over most of the world. Right, so you here will not suffer the consequences that we do in most of the world from the same practices. So listen to what I'm saying and what we've learned in the harder parts of the world to manage, because that will also be useful to you here to get higher productivity, better results, all right? But it also will help you here to change the policies of other countries. Because if you preach something here as the answer to desertification, and that practice you're preaching would cause desertification, you're not doing yourselves a favor. So I will talk about other parts of the world, but they, every word I say is applicable to you in one way or another. So when we look at the parts of the world where desertification is occurring, we don't find our abandoned cities like this under jungle, we find them under desert sands. So that's telling you right away that if you rest land here, it will restore itself, it will restore biodiversity. If you rest land in most of the world, it will turn to desert. The biggest single cause of desertification is over-resting land. The exact opposite of what almost every human believes. Now, it begins with the effectiveness of rainfall. This is a term I had to come up with in 1960 when we had an extremely bad drought in Botswana, South Africa, and Rhodesia. And at the same time, we were collecting money for the flood victims in Mozambique. Same damn river, same rains. It didn't make sense. What I'd been taught at university made no sense. So we started to study that and we found non-effective rainfall, which is what we have over most of the world today, is rain that flows, when it falls, flows across the soil or it evaporates from bare soil. So it's non-effective, it gives us floods and droughts. Where effective rainfall 
penetrates the soil and then it only leaves the soil one of two ways. It leaves through green plants or it leaves flowing through the soil to rivers. That's effective rainfall that we used to have. Now, when the rainfall is non-effective, we get desertification and now most of your foreign aid, diffid aid, everything is dealing with symptoms of this. Increasing droughts and floods, poverty, social breakdown, violence, destruction of cultures, languages, emigration to Europe, and you're, it's changing the political face of Europe now, the immigrants you're getting. Recruitment to dissident organization, terrorist organizations, etc. One of the fundamentals of guerrilla warfare is cut the source of recruitment. You are causing the, the recruitment from the education and the policies flowing out from the UK, uh, Australia, America, etc. Uh, climate change is a symptom, and so we go on. All right, so when we look at that, why does it occur? And it occurs really because of one word, oxidation. In the, this part of the world, when grass, trees, anything die, we call it non-brittle because you can take the dead vegetation, dead grass, end of the year, and you can just crumple it up in your hand. It's soft like tissue paper. Come to part of the world where I live, take any dead twig, dead grass, at the end of the year, crumple it up in your hand and it crackles and it is brittle. It snaps and crackles. So that's why we call them brittle environments. Now, over most of the world, when the grass which provides the bulk of the ground cover, to keep the soil covered, to keep the rainfall effective. When that grass dies, it cannot f remove its own leaf like trees do. Trees cut off their own leaves. Whoops. Grass cannot do that. So when it is standing in the bulk of the world in sunlight, it now turns to chemical breakdown. Gradual, slow chemical breakdown. That can take 50 years to finish off one grass plant. The grasslands can't stand that. It kills grasslands and they turn to bare ground, desert, scrubs, etc. All right, so if we're going to deal with that globally, happening over billions of hectares of land every single year, over vast regions of the world, we can only do so by using a tool. As I mentioned yesterday, you cannot even drink water unless you go to the nearest river and use your hands. You cannot drink water without a mug, a cup, some tool. So we can have all the creativity, money, and labor in the world to deal with climate change, and we cannot even drink water without a tool. We, have, we are a tool-using animal. So we have to use some tool. Now, what tools do we have? I got criticized by some academics because in a TED talk in 2013, I said we have no option. The only thing now that can save civilization globally as we know it is livestock properly managed. And I was criticized because what sort of scientist is stupid enough to say we only have one option? We always have hundreds of options, do we? Has anybody ever thought about that? So what options do we have as tool users? We can use the tool of technology. We had that for nearly two million years, like other tool using animals. We had sticks and stones as our first technology. We could chip the stones, we could sharpen the sticks, we could not change our environment any more than an otter or a, a crow or a vulture or a baboon, any other tool using animal. Then, Unlike other tool-using animals, we got a second tool. We got the tool of fire somewhere about a million, million and a half years ago. Now we could melt the stones and go into the copper, the bronze, the iron age, and our technology could develop till I could use this computer, we can put a man on the moon. Every single thing in this room was made possible by fire. Without fire, none of the clothing you have or anything could have been produced. So for 99.9% .9 of human existence, we've had two tools. That's all that's in our toolbox, technology or fire. 
about 10,000 years ago, farmers, we suspect, developed the idea, the idea of resting the environment as a positive action, conservation, probably developed with pastoralists, moving their livestock to let grass grow, or with arable crop farmers, rotating their crops to let soil recover, the idea. So now we have three tools. Train in any university, in every profession in the world, and you will only be trained to use technology, fire, or conservation, resting the land. There is no other tool. The only other thing we do is we use technology, like we do to drink water, we use technology to plant trees, believing that that can solve the problem, or shrubs or grass. But that's another use of technology. All right, so go through these tools and what hope has any technology of dealing with oxidation of grass plants over two thirds of the world. Even in science fiction, we can forget that one. No technology can solve the problem. I think I can say that with complete confidence. What about fire? We burn and burn and burn. It's supported by environmental organizations and everybody. I've been criticized for my ignorance and not knowing that you have to burn grasslands to keep them alive. We burn over 42 times the size of the UK of grasslands every year in Africa to try to keep them alive with enormous effects on the climate. So we can forget fire, it is just rapid oxidation and it exposes soil and makes the rainfall less effective. Now what about resting the land? That's our last tool. What about that? The whole world believes in it. Well, here is totally rested land in the a national park in the United States, turning to desert as badly or worse than anything I've dealt with in Africa. In that, they have signs appealing to the public not to even step off a path because of the damage you will do if you trample on that soil. The Aldo Leopold Forest, wonderful man, wonderful uh, work he did. He has a forest in New Mexico to uh, celebrate him, supported by wonderful organizations. And what do we find if we look at the Aldo Leopold Forest? That's what we find. Bare ground, oxidizing grass, turning to desert. Right alongside the Rio Grande River. Thousands of people visit it and say it's wonderful. It's Aldo Leopold Forest. It's not wonderful. What about planting trees? The Israelis are doing it at over 10,000 euros per hectare. It was done by the Nabataeans thousands of years ago. Their whole civilization was based on harvesting water, swales, planting trees with harvested water. They failed. What about the United Arab Emirates? They're trying very hard. They've spent over $30 billion on 1% of the land desalinating water, planting trees. The desert is just marching through. None of these deal with the cause. None of these deal with oxidation. What about the Chinese? They're spending millions and millions of dollars planting goodness knows how many trees, and now up to a quarter of a million tons of sand are dumped on Beijing in some days. The desert will win, not the city. So we've now come to the end of our tool bag. We look at these and we find we've got to get rid of that grass by the end of the year. That's on our land in Africa. It's had four months of rain. We've got to get rid of it. It'll oxidize if we don't. We've got to get rid of it somehow biologically so it can keep growing the next season. Technology can't do it. Fire can't do it. Resting land can't do it. Planting trees can't do it. Are we doomed? <laughs> Are you just gonna get more and more people from us in Africa swamping you? This is serious stuff. Let's get constructive on why we have to use animals. These environments that we're looking at here, these seasonal environments, are the environments in the world where the soil, the plants, the trees, the grasses, 
all develop together over vast periods of time. They develop together, not one before the other, and there were millions and millions and millions of animals. And in that dry time of the year, when oxidation takes over from biological decay, the moisture was in the gut of the animal. That's where the moisture was, when the land, the soil, and everything dried out. And these millions and millions of animals were accompanied and co-evolved with pack hunting predators, big packs. They're gone today. I was fortunate enough to be able to see up to 40 lions in a day just walking as a young man in Africa. But those are gone today, these big packs. They were ferocious. How did these animals protect themselves? The females don't have horns. They've got babies to protect. How do they protect themselves from lions, wolves, hyenas, etc.? They did it by getting into a bunch, just as you are today. The pack hunter is afraid of the bunch. That was the protection. If you were animals and you were bunched just as you are now, you would be dunging and urinating all over your own food. No species, including us, likes to feed on their own feces. It was the dung and the urine that made them keep moving. Not the predators. The predators made them bunch, the dung and the urine made them move. Now, if that situation was like that, you've got to ask yourself now, if there were so many millions of animals with these ferocious pack hunting predators, those millions of animals must have overgrazed the world terribly. It must have all been one desert. Because don't your universities, your environmental organizations, doesn't everybody teach you that overgrazing is too many animals? You know it. Thousands of peer-reviewed papers state that overgrazing is too many animals. So why wasn't the world overgrazed? What is society's belief? We've said it, too many animals, that's all that overgrazing is. What is the science? We're going to have to return to science, not beliefs that have assumed scientific validity or proof by authority. Thankfully, André Vauzin, a Frenchman, discovered about 70 years ago that overgrazing has got nothing to do with animal numbers. It's got everything to do with how long the plants are exposed and when are they re-exposed. Whether there's a million cows or one cow, it doesn't change the fact. It only changes the number of plants overgrazed. All right, so the science is clear, but the myth prevails. UK farmers, your policies differed, UK aid, the United Nations, sustainable development goals, they're all causing desertification and climate change because they're influencing the world and believing that you have too many animals. All right, so when we realized this in the 1960s, and I came to this realization in Africa that, oh my God, I've been so wrong because I had condemned livestock, I had developed and coined the words game ranching to in the full belief with British and American ecologists that if we could just get rid of your damn livestock, we could heal the whole world with wildlife. And that was one of my big mistakes. It's a multi-billion dollar industry today and I was wrong. All that land is deteriorating still. And I realized we need livestock. Now, how will we to do it? How would you graze livestock? We'd had over 10,000 years of pastoralists bunching and herding and moving their animals. Extremely knowledgeable people, more knowledgeable than any of us in this room. Their whole culture was livestock. So they had been mob grazing, bunching, moving, rotating, whatever you like, their animals for 10,000 years and it led to the great man-made deserts of antiquity, biblical times. So we knew we couldn't do that. 
over most of the world. Remember, you can do almost anything in Britain. You won't cause desert, but your policies will. All right, so that wouldn't work. Then we'd had about 100 years of modern range science, largely developed in America and South Africa, Rhodesia. And that, as we first discovered in Africa, accelerated desertification when we got fencing and grazing systems. That accelerated the desertification, it didn't solve it. Right, so we're back then with how do you do it? We knew that when we had this massive grass after the rain, it had to be biologically cycled and livestock had to do it. That's when putting all the clues together, I realized we've got to do it with bunched animals in some way. And just to show what it does when we bunch cattle to mimic the nature of old, we can get all that down as dung, urine, no rainfall going to flow off that. It's all going to go in. None is going to evaporate out of the soil. We're now reversing desertification. And when you look at that exact same piece of ground, when the rains came the following season, you can see it beginning to grow, and then there it is. So we knew we had to do that, but how? Now, Voisin had given us a clue. He had shown us why rotational grazing wasn't working, even in Europe. He had studied it in Britain, Germany, France, and he'd seen that we lose biodiversity. So problems are developing with it. He understood why. He understood that no grazing system would ever work, and no grazing system does. They all cause desertification. And so he had replaced rotational grazing with a very simple planning process where you plan from recovery periods back to grazing periods, and on that basis, using a map and a, so on, simple planning, you could uh, resolve the problem in Europe. So we took his work immediately and tried it in Africa and came unstuck. We fell on our faces. We were in a different environment. At that point, I realized, Rosanne is right, he's not wrong. We have to replace management systems with some form of planning process. Now, how do we do it? He's right, but we've got to go to a more sophisticated process. At that point, rather than reinvent the wheel, I looked at every profession that I could. Who had ever dealt with very complicated situations that could change rapidly, as grazing can in seasonal rainfall environments? And logically, I looked at the military. We were part of the British Army, the Rhodesian Army was, and literally all of us as Army officers were trained how to do planning in immediate battlefield conditions. I just took 300, 400, whatever it was, years of European experience expressed in all the military academies of Europe, and I simply took our planning procedures and how had the military learnt over centuries to train men rapidly in times of war, to train men how to come up with the most likely plan at any moment in time, no matter how stressed, wounded, hungry, it didn't damn well matter, come up with a plan quickly. How had they learned to do that? They had learned to do it by breaking it up into little components and dealing with one little component at a time, building on one another, coming up with the best possible plan. Easy. Don't reinvent the wheel. So I said, let's do that for farmers so that we can integrate livestock, wildlife, everything, seasons, droughts. We can integrate it all like this. Problem was, we fight battles for short periods. Farmers have to plan for months and in very dry areas for two years sometimes and battles weren't fought that way. So how did we do that? Easy, put it on a piece of paper. On one piece of paper, you can express four dimensions and a child can understand it. And that worked immediately. We did that on the first ranches in Rhodesia and immediately began to reverse desertification. And we have never, ever had it fail yet. Over 50 years later, we have had thousands of farmers fail to do it and say it doesn't work. 
We have never had anybody do it and fail. It has so many years of work behind it, that simple process. Now, before we went public with this, a big London-based company turned to me for help. They had the Liebig Ranch in Rhodesia, over a million and a quarter acres, 60,000 cows, and that was badly turning to desert. They wanted my help, and I said to them, look, everybody in the world says I'm wrong including Bozan, because I wanted to use a radial layout of fencing. Um, and they said, what do you propose? I said, give me the worst land you can find. Let me have some of your cattle. Let me see what I can do with this process. And if you like it, we move on. So we chose the worst land in the country, 4,000 acres. I offered Glyn Richards, who was then chairman of the Rhodesian Cattle Growers, I offered him a five pound note if he could show me a single grass plant in a hundred mile drive. That's far worse than anything you've got or will ever see in Britain, right? And on that 4,000 acres of the worst land they had, we went to three times the stocking rate immediately. And we produced solid grassland no reseeding, no machinery, just the cattle, three times as many cattle on one thirtieth of the land at any point in time with the process planned and it produced solid grassland. That was called an advanced project. We didn't call it a trial because we were trying to cause failure. My reasoning was if I push this and push the envelope ridiculously hard, if this is going to fail, let's make it fail right away. We could not cause failure. That situation we ran for eight years. Our war, our civil war was getting worse and worse. Finally, we could only visit this with armored cars, uh, etc., because of the mines and so on. The last night I ever visited it, I had to sleep under my plane with a machine gun all night while trying to work all day. We were really getting into a chaotic situation and then I was out, I was exiled. Because we were fighting a civil war during this time. And it was four years till I could get back. And when I got back, this is what I found, complete collapse. So we could not cause failure for eight years and then the same managers in the next four years, it completely collapsed. What had happened? We went over it and I said, what was the first thing you did? And they said, frankly, we breathed a sigh of relief. You'd bug it off. Because <laughs> I had an airstrip next to that and I used to fly in and land there and insist that that planning be done. It was one hour's work to two hours work twice a year. It was four hours work a year, but I insisted that they did it. When I had gone, they said the first thing they did was drop the planning. Why, why did we need to plan? It was flat ground. They'd been doing it for eight years. All they needed to do was graze every one to two days, keep the cattle concentrated, rotate them. Well, there's four years of rotation complete collapse. They said it was due to drought. Uh, I walked on the land and pointed out that every single plant was overgrazed. I've never in my life seen drought overgraze a plant. Only animals do that. Now, what about higher rainfall? When we did that advanced project, we did another one at Agava, uh, a fellow called Rutherford, in higher rainfall, about 40 inches of rain, and again, same story, we greatly increased the livestock, we produced grass right up to the water point, this is the water point in the foreground, you can see that tree in the background, you can see how dense the grass was at the gates, um, not even any trailing, this is holistic plan grazing as we today call it, all right? Now the same story, when I was gone, and no longer landing on the airstrip next to this and keeping it going, when I got back, that's what it was. It, not a complete collapse. I think there were a few cattle left on it, but virtually every plant overgrazed. Same story, he blamed drought, but every plant was overgrazed once he converted to rotational grazing. So I put that as a warning uh, to you to be careful. 
Now, what this led to was us going back and saying, why are we getting these erratic results? Why are people not following through? What are the other reasons? Because I'm, I was working in five countries at that time with hundreds of, of ranchers, and every single one of them had slid backwards. So we had to ask, well, why is this happening? And start to look at social and economic reasons. Some of them it was economic reasons, etc. That led with me being in America and working with 2,000 scientists and many thousands of ranchers on solving that. And that led to holistic management, which only finally we got going in 1984 in New Mexico. At that point, the planning process became holistic plan grazing. The holistic meaning that decision-making, social, economic, etc., cetera, uh, with the grazing planning. Now that is what we suggest we use because that works. Where none of the other ways have worked on these vast areas of the world with the dry. Now what happens in society is when I tell you something and you tell someone else, the message gets distorted. We used to say in, uh, in my country, we used to say, when you pass the message, send reinforcements, we're going to advance. By the time it had gone through two people, it became send refreshments, we're going to advance. Right? And so with holistic plan grazing, when I went to the United States and started to train thousands of people, all right, at that time, there was only continuous grazing. In Vermont, some people were working with Wazan's work, and there was Gus Hormay's rest rotation system. That's all there was. Within six months, there were something like 13 grazing systems developed. The search for novelty corrupts, and people have to twist something and give it a name of their own, Unfortunately, it's like me taking your joke and telling it as my joke, but forgetting the punchline. They all drop the hand, the process. So you can try any of these many grazing systems. There are now grazing gurus and grass whisperers all over the place. You can use any of them in the UK. They'll work. But if you promote those as solutions to climate change, you will do damage in the bulk of the world through your aid organizations, universities, education, etc. Now, if you want to know if you should ideally use the planning process, which has been developed for over so many centuries, or you could wing it and just do it with a map and a calendar. If you want to know, I actually have a simple test and it, you can test yourself. So let's have some fun with this one and, and test. So it's a very simple test. It's slightly complicated. I'm not even going to give you a complex problem. So I'm not going to throw in anything complex. I just want you to count the dots. Do you think you can do that? Let's, let's try. How many did you get? How many dots? Did you get 11 dots? Hold up your hands, all the ones who got 11. Good, clever. All right, let's do it again. 11 dots is well done. Now I'd like you to count the dots and the crosses. So we'll do it this at the same time. Okay, how many of you got 14 dots and 11 X's? <laughs> Hold up your hands, the liars. <laughs> if you didn't get 14 dots and 11 X's, do yourself a favor if you're a farmer, use the planning process. Because <laughs> if you'd got that, you might get away with the other. Please take me seriously. I've done it with so many thousands of farmers, given them a very simple farm plan, really simple one. You've got so many herds and 
heifers and cows and you've got some maize and you've got a bit of an orchard and you've got some game birds and just a very simple thing. I've given them a map, given them a, a calendar, given them unlimited time and said, plan the grazing. And they just get in a muddle. And then we've said, forget it, just use the process. Even though you've never used it before, just follow the steps that it, it tells you in this process and boom, out comes a perfect plan. There isn't a farmer in the world who can do it in his head. So you can use any of those techniques, but it'll be used like using a, any brand of car, or you can use a Rolls Royce or whatever. It'll make your life simpler. So I'm, I'm really urging you to think about that uh, seriously. Yeah, in an environment like yours, this is in Sweden, people using electric fence and planning their grazing uh, properly and doing very well with it. I want to finish up now by pointing out how essential this is again. These are the uh, things said to be leading to climate change, carbon dioxide, uh, nitrous oxide, uh, methane, black carbon, and desertification. And from fossil fuels, roughly the stuff that's in black, and from agriculture, us guys, the stuff that's in brown. So we've got roughly um, half and half. I believe, I don't have figures, I, I believe agriculture is actually a bigger cause of climate change than even the fossil fuels. So let's look at what we can stop putting in the air, all right, without livestock. So what can we stop putting with technology, fire, and rest? We can stop that. And people are trying to find alternative fuels. Only technology can solve that part of the problem. What else did we stop going into the air? Climate change will continue unless we farmers get off our backsides. Okay, so let's look at what we can stop if we add livestock properly managed. What can we now stop? Oh my God, the whole lot. It now becomes possible. That is why I believe we have no option but to do that. Now what about the atmospheric excess? There's already a lot up there, apparently. Now where are we going to put it? And how are we going to put it? If we look at that excess, if we try to put it in the oceans, apparently they're already acidifying badly. If we try to put it in the trees, as people believe, we can use technology and plant trees. All right, trees are just part of the ambient cycle. They recycle it, like all of us do. We're part of the ambient cycle. You're all carbon, and when you die, it goes back. Same with trees. Okay, so where might we put it? If planting trees is really going to work and putting it in the ocean isn't going to work, we're going to have to put it in the soil. Thank goodness people are beginning to wake up to that now and talk about the importance of the soil because that's where we can put it, in the soil. Now, how are we going to do that with technology? Geoengineering, make biocarb, make this, make that. Use energy, use technology, and try and shove it in the soil. Geoengineering is highly dangerous. It's like playing Russian roulette with all chambers loaded. <laughs> Nothing without risk there. Take livestock, and now we can begin to put it in the soil safely. Helping us with our crops, our mixed crops, all the stuff that you've been hearing at this wonderful conference and using livestock as an additional tool to help put it down safely in the ground. So to summarize, without livestock, we can stop roughly half being generous. We can't remove anything and desertification will continue. Add livestock and the whole lot becomes possible. 
If we could go to any nation and ask, or globally, say, where could we go around the world and look at some land, some management, and understand how the technology of that civilization is doing. We wouldn't look at croplands because many things can be blamed we can, for what is happening. We can blame machinery, we can blame corporate malfunction, we can blame all manner of things. One place we find in any nation where we don't have anything we blame is national parks. So we did a little check on that the other day down where I live, and we took a drone and we did it at the best time of the year. This is the best the land can be. And we looked at national parks compared to land managed holistically, where the only difference is the management. Let's see if that will show here. It's just one minute. And remember that covered soil is the key. This is Zambezi National Park with all the knowledge of the Western world, predominantly bare ground desertifying, causing climate change. Communal land around us, predominantly bare ground, habitat for humans, deteriorating. Chobe National Park in Botswana, bare ground, bare ground. And then we fly over Dibangombe, same time, same animals, same climate, same soil, holistic management. All that's changed is the dealing with the cause of climate change. And this is after 16 bad years, and this year being the driest we've ever known. And that's the only tool we've used is livestock. And we greatly increased the livestock, and now we have to double their numbers to just keep pace with the production of the land. There are, thankfully, hubs now developing all over the world where people are getting together, academics, researchers, farmers, pastoralists, just getting together to start learning together how to manage holistically and begin seriously attacking our problems. Thank you. Uh, has anybody got any um, questions? So oh, sorry, thank you, Alan. That was completely fantastic. <laughs> One in the front here, man in a hat. A lot of the stuff on the on the BBC and things like that is all telling us all cli stop climate change, become vegan, and I I think that we need more animals. And why isn't the message getting out that we should be using animals to stop climate change? instead of us all being told, become vegan. I've got hearing aids, and I was battling to hear that a little bit. So, uh, why, why is the media focusing on, on encouraging people to go vegan and, oh. and get rid of that? Yeah. Um, don't forget, the vilification of livestock is very ancient. It, you can go back in ancient texts and see them blaming the nomads for causing the deserts. That hatred of livestock, fear of livestock, is throughout society. Hundreds of celebrities now are putting their fame and their fortune behind the vegan movement, uh, etc. And they've also got people condemning livestock because of the methane, and you've also got people arguing, discussing how much carbon could be put in soils of the grasslands of the world. Let me deal with all three of them together. Let me assume for a moment that every human became vegan. We never eat beef again or cattle again, livestock again. We just let them die naturally. Let's assume that cattle put out 20 times the methane that they actually do. And let's assume that we could absorb no carbon at all in the grasslands of the world. So take those three as assumptions to be true. Now, what would you do about climate change? You've still got to use livestock. What would you do about desertification? All the emigrants pouring into Europe. 
all the droughts and floods. There is no option. We are just wasting time with petty arguments and academic arguments. And tragically, vegans are putting their fame and fortune behind that. I mean, celebrities are. Um, the problem of oxidization happens in the non-brittle en environments. How does it express itself in the brittle environments? Yeah. It's sort of booming in my ears. Yeah, well, I didn't hear it very so can, can you hear me like this? Yeah, try it. The problem of oxidization happens in the non-brittle environments. No, in the brittle environments. In the brittle environments. How does it express itself in the non-brittle in the non, uh, if you all got that, I understand he's asking why does oxidation occur in the brittle environments, that's seasonal humidity, where there's a long period of dry, why doesn't it occur in the non brittle environments? And the reason for that is in the non brittle environments, like here, the atmospheric humidity is so high throughout the year that the populations of microorganisms and fungi and everything in the soil, in the litter, in the plant bases is so high that biological decay is able to continue without having to have the moisture of the gut of the animal. I'm battling to hear this. Is desertification happening in the non-brittle? No, here, as I uh, mentioned, you can manage as badly as you like. You can't create the bare soil. Your, your plants grow close to each other. Just walk out onto the grassland here, and you see how the plants are so close to each other. That is a function of your environment and the humidity that you have. Now. When I was at university learning basic plant ecology, we were told that in the dry areas uh, and the seasonal areas, the plants were widely spaced because the roots fully occupied the site. And so you had these big spaces between the plants. Well, no, that wasn't true. As I was able to find out from masses of observation in the field and, and interpreting what I was observing, we finally realized that in the brittle environments, the seasonally dry ones, the plant spacing is a function of animal behavior. When we change the animal behavior, the plants close up. That's why we have to change the behavior of the animal in the holistic plan grazing. We don't just change the timing, we change the behavior as well. I, it might help you to fortify that point. In Baluchistan once, I went to a water point that the pastoralists had used for 5,000 years. And I got the guy taking me there, Dr. Zahur, uh, to explain how the pastoralists behave. And he explained them coming to the water in family groups with their sheep, their dogs, their camels, unpacking their tents, the kids run around, the dogs run around, the sheep run around. They're coming there one after the other for 5,000 years. He said, it's devastated. I said, well, let me form my own opinion. And when we got there, it was down to a monoculture of one species of grass that could withstand 5,000 years of overgrazing. I asked him to put his foot on bare ground without touching a living plant. He couldn't do it. The plant's spacing was sufficiently close. Then I said, as we left the water, how do the pastoralists behave? And he described them over 5,000 years protecting their flocks from the wolves. In other words, keeping them calm, letting them spread out as they grazed under supervision, watching them. And I said, fine, you're now describing a very high level of rest of the land because the animals aren't disturbing it. And you're describing a very low level of overgrazing of plants. That sample every mile as we went out and I stopped at the 16 mile point and I have a photo of him in a big area as big as this floor here of bare ground between the plants and looking at one overgrazed plant. But as we got out from the water, the grass got taller and taller, but the space between the plants got wider and wider. The desertification got worse and worse. 
Partial rest, we call that, where animals are on the land, but you've changed their behavior and the plants open up and desertification occurs. It, it's, it was sufficiently difficult that it took us 10,000 years to work it out. Um, I'd like to ask, on the example of the drive that you had for 100 miles and you couldn't find a blade of grass, and then the answer was to put 40,000 cows or something, what did they eat until the system had got going? <laughs> I'm always asked that question. It's, uh, what I did was I said, okay, on the, picture this room. And I said, all right, this land is so bad, there isn't a single grass growing. Not, let alone a blade, there wasn't a grass plant growing. We had weeds and we had uh, some shrubs and trees with leaf fall. But that was keeping some cattle alive. Cattle were running on that land still as it got worse and worse. So I said, right, now I want to take those cattle and greatly increase them on that land. Now, how do you do it? You do it with the planning process by dividing the land up. So picture this room with uh, cattle in it, low numbers because there's so little feed, but we can carry them for the year. So let's say it's X number of cattle. Now, if I divide this room in half and put the cattle on this side, it can hold them for 180 days. That has let those plants grow. If I divide it in quarters, it can hold those cattle for 90 days. That has let these plants grow for 270 days. Do you get the idea? So I took that land and I divided it into 30 pieces of land. Now I only had to put those animals and plan their movement wherever they went to plan with a one day to two days, occasionally maybe three days, and then keep them moving. And I had to make sure that they didn't come back under at least 60 days, 30 to 60 days. So I planned that way and I said, why don't we go to doubling the animals immediately, which we did, found it was too few, so we trebled in the first year. That's how we did it. Another way of picturing it is when the cattle or the goats or whatever are out there all day and every day, as I've just been looking at in, in Spain and Portugal, uh, they are shaving the ground. They're not letting plants grow. So if I shave one side of my face every day or second day, it stays smooth. This side becomes a bloody bush. Where did this hair go? I never let it grow. When you keep animals on the land all the time, they don't let the plants grow. So that's how we did it. The planning process, and just understanding that principle of let the plants grow. And of course, once we went to three times the number of animals on one thirtieth of the land, that's the equivalent of, what is it, 900% increase in stocking rate? Now you're getting much more hoof action, dung and urine to get more plants growing. And the result was they grew. If you have difficulty understanding that, join the old ladies in tennis shoes in the garden club. They'll tell you. Cover soil, break the surface, plants will grow. I think most of us have uh, followed the logic of the case that you've put, and seeing is believing in terms of the photographs there. But in terms of the science, is there any independent researched figures there to demonstrate the carbon sequestration rates that go with the pictures that you have shown? I can't hear a word of that. <laughs> But is there any science to, to, to back up the, the carbon sequestration rates or to, to say what carbon sequestration rates are? Uh, in grasslands? In the grasland, yeah. The yeah, issues. yeah there, there's um, a lot of uh, data on what carbon can be sequestered and more and more will come forward. Uh, the Savory Institute is working with researchers and various uh, organizations and universities to get more of that data. The point I'm making to you, and it's the personal one, I think that global climate change 
desertification should have been put on a war footing 50 years ago. I think we're fiddling and wasting time when you want to establish something like that when you know that you still have no option. So go ahead and start healing the deserts, healing the land while you gather more data. But what people are doing is saying, let's not move until we've got more academic information. That is just institutional stupidity to me. I'm speaking personally here, uh, very anxious about the future for future generations. So one, one last question, please. Can you hear me? Yes. No, I, I, I've got you. I don't advocate anything except that you manage holistically. That's the only thing I know to advocate. For years while I was developing this, I was uh, a consultant and operating internationally. As, as a member of parliament, I got access privy to figures on other consulting firms and big ones. And I always thought I was a little guy and when I got access to the privy to the figures of others, I realized I wasn't the little guy. I was actually earning way more than many people were in that field. And so here I was operating in all these countries and doing this and trying to work it out. And then it dawned on me and I stopped consulting. It dawned on me that with the people I was helping, uh, the advice I gave, I was wrong 99% of the time. The only re times I was right was sheer damn luck. So I stopped consulting. I, I realized all I can do is help people, train people to make these decisions themselves, which will bring the best practices to the top for them. There's too much complexity in the family, the farm, the environment, the, the economy, the only experts on any farm are you, the farmers. And we have to just give you a better way of dealing with that complexity. And that's all I advocate. And I do say to you, you will need to put livestock in your tool bag. And you'd be wise to change policies quickly. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, and okay. a completely wonderful talk. Thank and, you. And uh, a hopeful, hopeful message, message for humanity, and particularly for you lot as farmers. And um, just like to say thank you very much, and what an honor it is thank to you. have you here. Well, thank you.